Morning, everybody. Uh, good to have you here today. I'm Camille Bruard. I'm the Senior Marketing Executive here at Myager Toolkit, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar. So for those of you who are new to us, uh, Myager Toolkit provides HR software for SMEs, and we also run an ongoing program of webinars covering a variety of HR and business topics. And today we're hosting not one, not two, but three guest speakers who are here to answer your questions on various aspects of mental health and resilience in the return to work. As a quick overview, we'll be looking at managing stress and staff anxiety during times of change, starting conversations about mental health and illness, and improving psychological safety in employees. Following um, our sort of introduction here, um, basically we'll, we'll launch into the first section and um, we're going to spend about 15 minutes on each section. Um, so make sure to get your questions ready for each and we will have a little bit more time at the end as well uh, for more questions. And um, if you do want to ask a question for the panel to answer, um, please use the Q&A option, uh, which you'll find in the toolbar. There's a little Q&A box uh, with two speech bubbles there. So if you can ask your questions there, uh, that'd be fantastic. Um, you can also get involved in the chat with any sort of comments or observations or anything, um, but if you do want to ask a question for the panel to answer, please do ask that in the Q&A, uh, just so we don't miss your questions in the chat. And uh, just as a bit of a brief note, um, today's session is offering general and not specific legal advice. And um, also just before we get started, um, just to let you know that we have another webinar coming up in a couple of weeks, um, and that is on how to conduct a fair disciplinary investigation. And so I'll add a link to that registration page in the chat, uh, just in case you want to sign up to that next webinar. So just pop that link in there. Cool. So without further ado, I'm here to talk to us this morning about mental health and resilience are Zoe Thompson, who is the founder of Phoenix Life and Wellbeing Coaching, Steve Phillip, he was a suicide prevention and workplace well-being advocate who founded the Jordan Legacy CIC and Asha Berzon, who was founder and lead clinical psychotherapist at MindAbility Hypnotherapy. Um, so a panel, if you wouldn't mind um, coming on to, to Cameron, Mike. Morning, Camille. Uh, morning, morning, everyone. Good morning, How are we everybody. all this morning? <laughs> Good, good. Yes, very well. I'm suddenly realised that having wear, wearing a summery T-shirt, I'm looking a little bit like an England su football supporter this morning. Ah. Right, I'm <laughs> free, but, uh, well, it wasn't the plan. But, uh, wrong with that. Yeah, <laughs> amazing. So, um, yeah, I've got a little slide with our speakers here as well with a bit of information. Um, so basically, we're going to launch into the first section now. Um, which is basically all around managing staff stress and anxiety during times of change, which is obviously very relevant at the moment uh, because we are all going through a lot of changes that have been in the last 18 months and uh, particularly with um, the 19th coming up and return to work, return to the office, um, it's big changes for quite a lot of staff. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll um, get on to that bit. And before we get started with questions, I uh, thought we'd run a quick poll um, just so we can get the audience involved. Um, so I'll just get the first question up. And basically, um, our first poll um, has a couple of questions. Um, one is, how are your employees feeling about coming out of lockdown? And then also, do you feel equipped and ready to deal with staff stress and anxiety in the return to work? Um, so I'm going to just launch that poll now. Um, so hopefully that will crop up for you. And uh, feel free to vote. It's anonymous. Um, so we won't be going, oh, so-and-so said this. <laughs> um, Yep, we've got some votes coming in. I'll just wait about 30 seconds just to let everyone have a chance. It's always interesting seeing the votes coming in. Just wait a few more seconds in case anybody else wants to vote. Okay, I think that's that's the majority of people. So I'll just end that poll there and share the results. So basically, um, and, and Zoe, I don't know if you want to uh, jump in on this one um, to, to respond to the results as well. Um, I think it looks like 
most staff seem quite quite anxious um but also that people are getting prepared for the return to work is that kind of in, in line with what you've come across yeah i think there are some people who can't wait to get back into that workplace environment and i think there are some people who have have some nervousness around it but are still looking forward to getting back into a routine i think some of it is um, surrounded by some of the other uncertainty and you know, we've just been talking about lockdown bubbles and people being sent home from school and homeschooling so I think that there's almost the issue and challenge of returning to the workplace and then there's the other things that surround that that create that added uncertainty for people which creates for a lot of people the stress and anxiousness it's not it's not the dealing with it it's the worrying about what may or may not happen and, and not knowing that's quite often what triggers the stress for a lot of people so I think now we're getting closer and I think now uh, organizations leaders are starting to communicate what that looks like it's reducing the uncertainty for a lot of people because they're now able to put, put plans in place and get their head around what is happening and what that's going to look like and I think a lot of organizations are starting to open up a little bit more about what employees want to happen as well as what the organization wants to happen and I think that's also helping to reduce some of that stress and anxiety for people as well. Awesome and um, I had a bit of an opening question for this section um, for you as well Zoe, um, just around how employers can reduce staff stress and anxiety during significant times of change such as coming out of a lockdown. Do you have any kind of initial tips on on what you would kind of want to see employers doing? I think a lot of it is for um, for leaders, but I think we all have a responsibility and a duty of care for our colleagues as much as the responsibility sits with leaders in terms of duty of care. But I think it's it's all about communication at the moment. I think it's sharing the information that you do have as an organisation, sharing what your plans are, what you're aiming to achieve as an organisation. But I think for leaders and for colleagues, it's about listening to what people are saying. But I think also what's really important is listening to what people are not saying as well. So just really being able to communicate and engage with staff, I think, is, is the key thing at the moment. Everybody is going to want something slightly different. Everybody has experienced COVID, but we've all experienced it in very different ways. The impact of the challenges will be very different, very individual. And so the return to the workplace is going to be very individual and it's going to be very different for different people. So I think communication is really key at the moment. Communicate what you do know, communicate what your intentions are, um, engage with your staff as much as possible, but listen to what staff need and ask how you can, those, that really open question of how can I best support you in coming back into work in a way that works for you as an individual and for us as an organisation. Awesome, yeah, so very much about striking that balance. Um, Asher and Steve, I, I don't know if you wanted to, to jump in with any observations on that as well. Um, I think just firstly, just to agree with, with Zoe, I, I've been speaking to a lot of employees with workshops I'm running on the subject of mental health and wellbeing, um, employees in Europe um, as well as the UK, and, and I think the Two things really came out of the feedback and conversation from breakout rooms there. Were, and it was interesting to see the poll result at the top where the majority of people said, we're getting there. Well, the 19th is pretty close. <laughs> you know, it's not far away. We kind of need to be there. And I think a lot of employees were saying, we're still not being communicated clearly enough. We've still got these re reservations. But the other important thing was, Zoe's absolutely right, it's about individual needs. There is not a one size fits all approach here that's going to, to work. So that open conversation about how can we best support you is really important. And I'd absolutely agree with um, what Steve and Zoe have said. It's that moving away from that, you know, this is the framework that we have in place and therefore everybody has to be shoehorned into the approach <clears throat> that fits well for the business. You know, we've realized over the last 18 months actually uh, we're far more able to be adaptable than we possibly have thought you know and that adaptability does have its toll on us and that's where recognizing that 
people's uh, responses to the pandemic and the way that they're currently managing it and how they're going to continue to manage life, you know, caring responsibilities, having to restructure the way that they're working. And I know, you know, we, we mentioned earlier that the fact that, you know, somebody in my family is having to self-isolate and, and the impact that's had. And, you know, I work for myself, so I've been able to juggle my diary, but knowing that as a organisation to help it thrive, we're all going to have to be a bit more fluid and how we do that constructively. Awesome. And um, we do have a couple of questions uh, coming in from the audience now as well. I had an interesting one from, from Anthony who asks, just, just from your observations, um, is there a difference in the age of employees who are desperate to return? Does there seem to be maybe more of a trend towards one or the other um, in terms of like demographics? I don't know if that's anything you've noticed in particular. I've, I've not noticed a pattern. I, and I work with a, a range of ages. My, my youngest client is 14 and, and the oldest one is in, is in their 60s. So I've not noticed a pattern. What I have noticed is it's very much about their personal circumstance that's had an influence. The introvert, extrovert, people who need to be around people to recharge, to energise, that's made a difference. And I think the workplace, the structure and the nature of the job has made a difference as well. So I think it's not necessarily a demographic, it's more about the circumstance which has dictated it. I and mean, I've worked with some people in the last 12 months who have been going into the workplace that's been arranged by their HR team, by their, their manager to help support their health and well-being because they needed to be in that environment. And for others, I know there are people having conversations with their managers about how they can continue to work from home because their performance is up, their, the circumstance at home actually allows them to thrive and perform better in work. So I think it's very, again, very individual. I think it's more about circumstance rather than demographic. I'm not noticing it as much in terms of age, gender, or, or any of the other demographics. It seems to be more about personal circumstance, either personal circumstance at home or the circumstance in the nature of the work that they do. Steve or Asher, was there anything you wanted to add to that? That's a pretty good answer. No, again, I would just agree with, with Zoe. I've not seen anything. Again, I don't work with quite that age range, um, uh, but certainly it, it is more about individual circumstances from my experience. Yeah, and I'd completely echo that. I mean, I think the youngest person I'm currently working with is a 12-year-old. Um, what seems to be probably the common denominator across all of them is the aspect of feeling lonely, loneliness you know, that sense of wanting to be connected. Um, and, you know, we all want to feel connected in some way, in some shape or form. Um, so I think that's probably been the only thing that I think has been the commonality, but it's very, very different for different people. I would add to what Ash is saying as well, in terms of the connection, how employees and employers and organisations team managers have stayed engaged and connected with their staff has made a big difference. I think that's probably one of the biggest differences that I've noticed in conversations with people is where they have still felt connected, they've still felt supported, not micromanaged, but they have still felt supported and that that connection with their manager, with their colleagues has still been there, that they have still been able to work in a very similar way, albeit at a different location. So yeah, to pick up on what Ash just said there, that connection and not feeling isolated, even though on occasions we have been in isolation has made a, made a real difference for people. And we've got a couple more questions coming in. Um, so I, might, I may, might move on to the next one. Um, I've got one from Maggie who asks, uh, it's basically said, our workforce seems to be split between people who are quite happy to throw away their masks and stop social distancing, but equally those that are fearful for their safety, etc. And how can we effectively manage both? We've amended our COVID policies and are looking to support everyone, but the differences in views and opinions can seem quite divisive. Uh, yeah, just a thought on uh, on that, Camille. I mean, uh, a lot of the employees I've spoken to, some of their concerns about going back to work are not necessarily what the company has put in place, but will my colleagues adhere to some of these uh, social distancing measures? And and uh, I think that's one of the concerns. How will these processes be managed 
really on an ongoing basis so that I feel safe coming back to work. And, you know, if my colleague decides to behave differently, how, how will that manage? Because that's going to give me stress if I have to deal with it myself. So, so I think how, how the processes are managed on an ongoing basis will be really important. I think it feeds into the communication again. Of, of, we're, we're getting into that phase now, aren't we, where it's about personal choice with guidance. And I think that will be the same within companies, that it will be about personal choice with the guidance of what the, the company or the organisation are setting as that sort of parameter boundaries. But it is going to be communication again of speaking to your colleagues, understanding what their concerns are, understanding how, even if you feel differently, that you can still be respectful and supportive of what the person who is sitting next to you feels and being able to respect that. You might feel totally different. You might have a completely different opinion on it, but it's about respecting the other people that are around you. And, and just, it's, again, it's the under, understanding and communicating. People are, some people are going to be more upfront with that and other people are going to be more reserved with that. So it's, I think, again, for, for uh, leaders to help bring those conversations together to help encourage the people who aren't as upfront about it to be able to share that and and to help facilitate that some of that understanding where where and views are going to be very strong in some of these areas of, of being able to negotiate that between individuals i think that kind of comes into the whole thing around the psychological safety at work as well doesn't it which we'll be obviously talking about a little bit later and i think it's absolutely right what steve and zoe have reflected that it's, it's a really difficult time and it's a difference of opinion and understanding the impact that's going to have for the person who would like somebody to wear a mask or not wear a mask or to be the person that's wearing a mask or not wearing a mask and having that space and, and giving people the opportunity to be able to feel like they're able to express those opinions, but doing it in such a way that allows the team as a collective, the organisation to start moving forward. And that, again, I think might be about remaining fluid. You know, the policies and procedures aren't going to always be as clear cut as they're going to be, because ultimately, um, you know, come August or September, if the rules change again, again, they're going to have to be responsive to that. So coming together and recognising what the common purpose is, what is it that we're trying to do? What do we all collectively believe in, I think, can help create or at least start those conversations in a, in a healthy way we don't have to agree with it but the important thing is taking time to understand why that's important to somebody else we might still agree to disagree but we take Absolutely. time to respect that person's um experiences and feelings and and to take the time to understand that and also that's what brings teams together isn't it is that brings Absolutely. That to that team of understanding that everybody is different everybody has something different to bring and contribute with it you don't have to always agree with it but take yeah. the time to show that respect to to take time to understand yeah um, I think we have time for one more question in this section. Um, I'm, I'm being taskmaster today, <laughs> just on the timing front, because I know that we're kind of trying to keep it in the hour. Um, I had a question in from Altab, who asks, um, what I'm not sure about is workplace engagement and connection um, due to the enforcement of social and physical distancing. Um, and sort of wondered what your thoughts were around kind of keeping people connected and engaged um, while social distancing is in effect. And, um, I don't know if anyone has any ideas around around that. Is this in the workplace itself, Camille? Yes, yeah, what, I think in the physical workplace. About. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. I know we're going to get onto conversations around mental health and making sure that the, the dialogue is is there. Um, uh, you would assume it's going to be a little easier being able to remain connected within a work and an office uh, environment um, uh, rather than the remote working that we've had so far so so this should automatically be an improvement in that i would think but um i do think that um you know conversation we've already kind of referred to this already is going to be really important i think well-being has to move so much further up the agenda now as far as companies are concerned and and you know it's not just a case of um we're going to have a well-being evening on tuesday night by the way who wants to come along um it has to be part of the dialogue it has to be part of the conversation we have to start asking people not what have you achieved today but how are you doing today and i think if if there is is that kind of leadership 
uh, and that's where it has to come from uh, so that people start to feel more comfortable in opening up and having that dialogue and then I think that will help people feel more connected because I think possibly a lot of people won't want to voice their concerns and fears of returning to work so they just kind of get on with it with their heads down so I think the conversations need to start pretty soon after people return to work if not before if not before not yeah before, absolutely not before they return and what Steve is saying is absolutely it's, it's mirrored in individuals and organizations I've worked with but it's also mirrored in the research and we know that there's a big disconnect between what organizations are providing in terms of well-being support and what individuals feel comfortable asking for help with and speaking up and opening <coughs> up about what they're experiencing and this isn't just about mental illness this isn't about getting down far down the line where you are with a GP for a diagnosis. This is about mental health, emotional health, physical health and well-being and looking after your staff. And there is a big disconnect in what employees are putting in place, but also what people are engaging with. And so those conversations are, you know, what Steve was just saying, it really, really important of just making it part of the everyday conversation, making it normal to share. And this is important for people in positions of responsibility as well. It's important for you to show vulnerability, for you to be open when things are tough, when for you to share that you're having a tough day and things <clears throat> feel a little bit more challenging today than they did yesterday, because that will encourage and give your people confidence to open up about what they're experiencing as well. So it's got to be in that everyday conversation. Yeah, and I can completely agree with that. It has to be part of the fabric of the whole the way it's it's great to have uh, policies or have beautiful statements saying you know we're an empathetic organization but how do we put it into practice you know how are we showing as managers as members of staff as admin support as the male person as the receptionist as the the ceo how are we showing that and putting that into practice and it's so important and i think that whole thing about remaining connected it's also about when you're having those conversations with staff, recognizing, you know, what's the anomaly? What's the difference? What am I noticing? What are people sharing with me that may be an ind indication that something's not 100% right or this isn't how this person manages particular situations? So, you know, getting to know your staff and, and I can appreciate if you've employed new staff during the pandemic, you haven't had that time and space necessarily to to get to know them but as the world starts to open up and actually you know even just sitting over zoom and taking that time to learn about them you know who's in your family who's important to you all of those sorts of things that brings that human element back into the work environment those are all really critical aspects because we all like to be treated like a human you know Awesome. I think that actually brings us along really nicely, <laughs> good segue here, um, into our second topic, um, which is all around starting conversations, having conversations, particularly around mental health and mental illness, um, when things are difficult, um, when things are good, just having those conversations. And um, so I thought that would be a, a nice little, uh, yeah, uh, move into the next section. And um, so we do have another poll. You'll be, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, and this one is all about starting conversations. And um, there's one question, which is how often do you check in with employees about their mental health? Um, so I'll just get that poll up now. So launch that poll. There's the one question there. And again, it's, it's all anonymous. And so if you do want to have a vote on that, and um, I'll just wait a second. You kind of need some, like, Elevator music, like waiting music or something, don't we? <laughs> Still got a few people voting, so I'll um Wait a few more seconds if you want to go on that one. Okay, 
Yeah, I think that's quite a few people who vote it now, so I'll share that result. Um, Steve, I didn't know if you wanted to, to jump in here as well to look at this result. Um, looks like we have a, a mix Yeah, of I mean, it's um, interesting, isn't it? Um, that, you know, quite, quite reassuring to see actually that a number are checking in, in weekly, um, uh, but occasionally uh, at nearly 50% is, is, is quite, quite telling, isn't it? And, uh, you know, maybe all sorts of reasons for that. But, um, you know, I was just thinking, you know, in answer to the question about getting the conversations going that, and we kind of referred to this a few minutes ago about well-being and, and the whole conversation being, being part of the fabric, as Asha said, of um, what we do. And, and you know, I think that's in meetings, you know, when we, you know, in Zoom meetings or face-to-face -face meetings, you know, are we asking as line managers how, how people are, are doing? Now, we know if we ask the question, how are you doing? Most people are going to say fine and put a smile on their face. Um, so we know on a personal level, you've often got to ask that more than once. But it could be something as simple as, you know, making it a little bit of fun as well with a, with a, with a poll, quick straw poll of the room. Look on a scale of one to ten, you know, where are you this morning? You know, I'm a, I'm a five, I'm a six, I'm a seven. And, and you know, the line manager makes a note of that and then goes back to those people that are anything below a seven or an eight and says, yeah, just interested why you scored yourself a, a five. You know, if we can just do some very simple things like that, because, you know, if we sit in the room, right, you know, tell me all how you're doing today. Everyone's going to go, whoa, this is a bit freaky. And uh, I don't really want to share this you know, with everybody verbally. So, you know, if we can get just get a little bit more creative with, with um, kind of understanding where people are at and then following that up, if we, if we think we we, sh we should do so, you know, maybe just a way there within the business environment to open up the conversations either online or, or face to face. Definitely, I'm just going to stop that poll first. Um, and yeah, just kind of um, in in relation to that, um, I've got a, an initial question for V to answer, Steve, um, which is why is it important to start having more conversations around mental health in the workplace? Look, we spend so much time there. You know, I, I think, you know, we, we are all day there, aren't we, with the commute, if we're going back to the office. And probably the last thing we want to do is, is if, if we are having a tough time, is at the end of the day, start to burden our spouse and family. Um, and I think we also, because we spend a long time uh, at work, um, we have time to think. Um, uh, and if some of those thoughts do, do fester and there's not an opportunity for us to maybe release that, um then then obviously you know this builds so I, I think it's it is so important to provide you know a psychologically safe space and environment at work where people think i just need i need to talk to somebody uh, and, and for that you know situation to be made available um again i use the term safe space uh you know we i know we use a lot but but that safe space needs to be available you know i heard it's really interesting i was speaking with a company uh, some company directors the other day and, and in hr and, and they were saying you know we, one of the things we recognize we've got to do is we've got to make sure that there is a room you know just a quiet room available rather than them all being booked up with meetings all day long because if someone wants to have that conversation where on earth do we do, do we go so you know i know companies are thinking about this but but yeah safe space is re really really important yeah, I know. Um, when I um, started working with, with my Edge Toolkit in 2019, I wasn't in a great place mental health-wise, no, very supportive. And I know that um, having just a little meeting room to go into, to be able to have a little cry or have a chat or, you know, kind of, um, yeah, let out some of that stress was so important um, in being able to, to stay at work and, and then be able to have somewhere. So I, I totally agree with that. Really yeah, cool. probably a lot nicer than a locked toilet cubicle as well, which is yeah, probably hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I see if yeah. there's any recognition when I made that statement there, but yeah, that's me. That's me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, Asher and Zoe, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to that. Or... I was just going to say, I think in terms of some of the organisations I've been working over, uh, with during this sort of last eighteen months, two years. 
is that there's been a real sort of um, shift in wanting to talk to people um, about their mental wellness. So talking to them, you know, what would it look like if you're in a good space, you know, so that the conversation is shifting. So managers are having a better awareness when they can see that there's a move away from that and helping people to understand, you know, what does it look like? when you're experiencing unmanageable stress? What do you notice about yourself? How do you cope with that or not cope with it? Because then that means it's something that um, staff uh, themselves can start to be aware that, gosh, you know, I'm, I'm not sleeping very well or I'm finding I'm getting a bit snappy or I didn't read that email quite as well as I should have done. Um, you know, and, and just recognizing these small cues in ourselves. And I'm feeling confident to be able to share that with our line managers and, and managers having those conversations, not as a way of, um, again, you know, as part of the communication, not as a way of trying to catch people out, but recognizing that if I can support you, or we as the organization can start to support you, we can then help you to manage that particular stressful situation better. And, and I think in that way, we're moving away from waiting for people to get poorly so they're not locking themselves in loose and crying and, and, and desperately looking for a, a safe space because all of those things are really important. And I think equally doing that preventative work, I think is, is absolutely critical as well. No, I would add to that and one of the things that I quite often do with individuals is to help them to understand what their what their warning signs are when things are starting to slip but also to give them the confidence to speak to family friends colleagues to let them know what the warning signs are because so often it's other people who pick up on it before we notice it ourselves denial's great isn't it of just head in the sand and just keep just keep going just get through this week just get to the weekend just keep going so understanding ourselves what our warning signs are how do we know when things are starting to take that downward spiral but also communicating that with the people around us so that they can help support and give them permission to say I have noticed this is everything okay give people permission when you're in a good space to do that and then it makes it so much easier people know that you are going to welcome that conversation when that time comes because you've already had that conversation and put things in place to be able to do that so it builds on what Ash is saying and, very, and what Steve is saying as well it's just know, knowing what that looks like for you and knowing what it looks like for the people around you so that you can you can do something about it when those early warning signs start to show yeah um, that, 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 I'm sorry just to add to that as well I absolutely agree I think there's a whole education piece required within organizations I know there's a question from from Helen there how important is line manager training in this and and, and I think training generally I, I delivered a, a, a talk to a large government office recently and um um, and it was really about how to spot the warning signs in ourselves and in, in others. What, what, what should I be looking out for? And it was really interesting that I got a, a, um, a message shortly afterwards from one of the event organisers, actually. She said, I'm, I, just to let you know, I'm just taking 12 days off um, kind of a mental health leave. Now, we would never use that term once upon a time, would we? But, but, and she said it was actually going through the talk that you delivered, I suddenly recognised what I was experiencing. I knew I was experiencing something, but I didn't know what it was. I now recognize clearly that I'm experiencing some elements of anxiety and depression, and I've decided to take some time out to for a bit of self-care and get that sorted. So, you know, I think a lot of people maybe are experiencing some of these stresses and symptoms, but not really knowing what it is they're experiencing. And if you don't understand what you're experiencing, you can't really then put in place a plan to deal with it. So I think that's really acknowledgement is half the battle, isn't it, really, when it comes to these things? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, we've got quite a few questions coming in. I'm just aware of time. Um, and I've got a great one um, that Gemma's submitted. Um, and Gemma says, I work in manufacturing, which is typically a male-dominated environment. Uh, what would your advice be on starting conversations with guys on the shop floor? How would you get them engaged in that type of conversation? 
Oh, is it all right if I leap in again? I saw this question a couple of minutes ago, actually. I thought, ah, right, yeah. Um, this is the big challenge, isn't it? Manufacturing, construction, male-dominated environments. How do you get guys to to talk and not just talk about the football and, and whatever else is going on? Um, um, yeah, I, I think, uh, coming back to a point, I can't remember if Zoe or Asher referred to this earlier, but I think having male leaders who are prepared to be open about their own experience is really important. But peer peer groups, I think, can be massively uh, important here, providing a, a group situation where men can come together and talk very openly. Um, and women, you know, with their own situations, ideally all employees together. But, but we do recognise that men typically, um, you know, do not talk as openly about these challenges. So I think peer support groups can be, be really useful. Awesome. Um, and I'll um, do a couple more questions and we can kind of like get different people answering just because we've got a few coming in now, which is fantastic. Um, so uh, someone's asked anonymously, in our small business, all staff work remotely and we'll keep on doing so. Um, do you have any suggestions on how best to start mental health discussions with everyone? We mainly have meetings over Zoom. And uh, there's, an issue, there's a related question, actually. Um, Someone else has asked, how often do we need to conduct key team conversations about mental health and when should we um, initiate individual conversations? So it's kind of the remote angle there and then also sort of the teams versus individual angle there as well and, and what you might need differently. I don't know if Zoe or Asha, you want to, to jump in on that? I think for me, uh, what I found with working, because most of my clientele is small to medium sized businesses, it's really... Um, interesting because once we shift the conversation from ment from mental health to mental wellness which has a slightly different connotation we're talking to people about what shows them that they're in a mentally good space um it it allows people to openly start talking about what it looks like when they're feeling like they're in a good space versus what it feels like for them when they're not in a, such a great space. And, and I think for me, having those conversations, it should be very much embedded as part of the conversations and, and not sort of in a, so now we're gonna talk about your mental wellness kind of way, just, you know, the, the general conversations that we would have with each other if we were seeing each other face to face, the conversations that you might have, for example, when you're stood grabbing a cup of coffee or a glass of water and you notice that someone looks a little bit upset, you know, having that, would you like 10 minutes to have that that chat or today you seemed a little bit quieter in the team meeting I think it's about becoming attuned into other people more than anything um and I was just having I'm just trying to scroll back up to the questions because I'm trying to make sure that I'd be as concise as I can because I know time I'm really sorry I, I think I've um, put those in the answered column okay um, that's fine so uh, yeah I mean I think for me it's it's not necessarily there should be, you know, it should be done three times a, a month or anything like that. I think it's it's part and parcel of the conversations that we're having with people, particularly when we're in such a challenging time at the moment. Awesome, thank you. Um, I can and just, I can oh, just yeah, good for I know in the interest of time. So my background is in the police. So again, another very male dominated industry, but also very masculine energy industry so it's there's lots of trauma lots of change resilience frontline working is kind of the sort of bread and butter of the job but it's also a, there's also a real culture around this is what we do this is what we're trained for this is what we should be able to cope with so it's almost that added kind of stigma and um the you know the, the added pressure of saying that you're not okay is not just about you as an individual but almost that I can't do my job and so that getting police officers police staff to open up is is a challenge in itself so there's quite often it's it's about creating that culture in your company and it is about everybody showing that it's it's not okay to not be okay but it's okay to say that you're not okay and it's okay to say I think I'm going to need a little bit of support with this and it doesn't need to, I think there's that, again, the stigma, isn't it, that if you say that you're not okay, somebody's going to fill out a form and you're going to get six counselling sessions and it will never be discussed in the office again. And I think there's so much more to wellbeing support. It might just be, actually, can we go for a walk? 
and just talk something through so that I can get it, get my head around it so that I can take some action. Sometimes that is all that is needed. And actually, for people who do find it difficult opening up, a walk where you're not face to face and there's not that intense eye contact and out in fresh air and moving is a lot more comfortable for some people as an opportunity for them to open up. So it's just about asking the question, how can I support you? What can I do to support you to work through this? Because it still empowers that individual to take ownership, but with your support and try different ways. Ask them, how do they want your support? Not assume that it's a flow chart of asking certain questions and working your way through the flow chart to know what questions or what support they need. And then um, that just reminded me of, of when you were saying about it's about getting people to talk and, and actually have those conversations and um, Helen asked a really great question which is is this about letting people talk or having solutions and I mean it sounds more like it's just having those conversations can often you know if not be the solution it can it can really help. I, I think that's really important I think a lot of people worry about asking the question and starting that conversation in case they don't have the answers the majority of the time people don't want you to problem solve they don't want you to roll your sleeves up and dig in and dig into their lives and fix things they want some an an opportunity to talk it through themselves I mean that's it's essentially what coaching is about it's about giving people that safe space to walk around their problem to walk around their challenge to look at it from different perspectives and for them to make the decisions on what they feel is the next best step for them not about finding the answers and there's a huge amount of support out there it's often just a case of listening and signposting and so you don't have to have the answers you don't need to know the right thing to say you just often just need to give people that safe space to talk you listen and you signpost and if you can't come up if you don't know the immediate signpost you say to them I'm going to take this away I'm going to have a look at it and I'm going to let you give you some options of things to explore. And if you want my support to do that, I can do that for you. Awesome. Thank you. I'm just aware of, sort of the timing on things. Um, we do have a lot of other really great questions coming in. But if we can move on to um, our final topic, which is improving psychological safety. And then hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end as well to, to answer um, any other questions that have come in. Thank you so much for sending all those in. Um, but yeah, see, I've got to, got to keep, keep cracking the whip, make sure everyone's on time. <laughs> um, so, right, uh, third section, last but not least, uh, we are talking about psychological safety, what that is as a concept and um, how to kind of improve that. So again, I'm uh, sort of repeating myself here, but I will begin with a poll again. Um, so I'll just get this poll up and basically, really quite a simple question, how much do you know about psychological safety? Um, so I'll launch that now and, and give you about 30 seconds to, to answer that poll if you want to answer. So anything from never heard of psychological safety all the way to it's an active part of what we're doing and what we're considering in our HR strategy. So if you give me a few seconds. Uh, most people have voted on that one so I'll just share the results and it does seem like most people have not heard of it um, which I guess not surprising I think it is quite a, a new concept um, and I do have a question for Asha um, based around this that, that continues quite nicely from the poll uh, which is what does psychological safety mean and how can workplaces improve this so just a, just a small question for you Asha <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> so interestingly, I think we've actually talked about uh, psychological uh, safety at work uh, in a practical sense. But uh, the definition is it's a shared belief held by members of a team that other team members won't embarrass, reject, ridicule or punish them for speaking up. So essentially, it's our ability to be able to share our beliefs, our experiences to feel safe to feel free from repercussions or minimization or dismissal of what we're sharing and talking about. Uh, so that's that's the basic definition of what it is. Do you want me to go in a bit more detail? 
Yeah, no, that, I think that's that's great as a that is I care as a concept. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and um, it seems yeah most people have either not heard of it or heard of it. Yeah. Um, and a few people are sort of looking into it, or it's, it's a part of their HR strategy. Um, so I'll just stop and it's this. and it's really interesting because actually as um as a model, it's very much based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is just essentially saying that you know we need our basic needs at work met before we can fully realize our potential at work. And, and part of that is that sense of belonging, is that sense that we're able to contribute and we have a per we have a common purpose. Awesome. And um, yeah, we've uh, got a, a few questions. One I thought that tied in quite nicely um, to, to psychological safety is, is from Altab, who asks, are there, there is a lot of stigmatization in talking around mental health. And how do we how do we get past this? Do you think that kind of conversations around psychological safety and, and kind of understanding of that might help? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, we've, we've already kind of talked very much about it starts with the entire work culture. It's great saying we have policies around mental health, inclusion, diversity, but how do we really put them into practice? How are we really implementing them? Not when something's not just going so great. Um, and, you know, making it part of that engagement that we have with our employees, making it part of the conversations so that, and I think, you know, like I said, I think we've all very much sort of talked about this in a roundabout way, which is if we're constantly having conversations about how can I help you to be able to do your work better? What can I do to support you? What might that look like? And I think Zoe described it beautifully earlier that it is about recognizing that you know, we're not necessarily, um, when we, we kind of almost do it as a, right now we're going to talk about mental health, we're almost creating We lost Asha. Frozen in mid-flow. She's paused, she paused for me, yeah. Um, well, <laughs> hopefully we'll, we'll get Asha back in a sec, uh, but Steve and Zoe, if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting because uh, psychological safety was something that I, I came across last year and like many people have not heard of it before. And, and it was interesting because my understanding, kind of the original definition of this came from a Dr. Amy Edmondson, who was studying clinical teams, but particularly studying um, uh, organisations where that were very outcome focused. Um, and they found that uh, through her studies that those teams that were very outcome focused tended to make more mistakes. Uh, even the good performers, and that put a huge amount of pressure on them. They were they were then concerned about getting punished for these mistakes. So often, what they would do is is kind of underperform. So the whole concept really was uh, of psychological safety was to provide that environment where it was about you know you know how I can support you, as Ashley was just saying, to to do your job better, and that's what my role is as a manager and a leader. Ultimately, leadership is about getting things done through other people. Um, so by removing, you know, this continual focus on outcomes, 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 if we actually look after the well-being of our employees, we will get the outcomes. But so many companies are not brave enough to really consider that, in my view. Did you want to add to that? It's, it's including mental health well-being alongside all of the other things that we do that help people to show up and and thrive in work so it's about you know it's it's about the individual isn't it it's about giving that individual the empowerment that space that permission to bring themselves the full version of themselves to work to and that that's you know we, we talk about that through diversity and inclusion we talk about that with health and well-being it's about how can you empower your individuals in your team to be the best selves in, in that working day? And sometimes that's about supporting them in the working day. And sometimes it's about supporting themselves. So it's giving them support outside of the working day that helps them to show up in the working day and vice versa. So I think it's about giving people that, again, it comes down to communication. It comes down to listening. It comes down to a very individual person-centric conversation of how can I help you be the best version of you when you come into work? How can I help you perform at your best? Because ultimately, 
you then get a high performing, well fulfilled individual, which is great for them. And you've also got a high performance, which is great for the business. So it's it's a win win situation. But it, again, it's something that I think in terms of leadership, it's a it's a different way for a lot of leaders to work. And it's taking some some changes and some changes in approaches and for some people it's going to feel quite risky in working in a different way because it is about trust and empowerment we've done that over the last 12 months 18 months of trust and empowering staff to work on their own under their own schedule make their own decisions a lot more and what we don't want to do is shut that back down because they've walked back through the office door so it's continuing to empower that and health and well-being comes into that as much as as all of these other topics of conversation that come up and it should yeah. be that in the same way, openly and honestly and regularly. Also, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned leadership actually and, and the impact of that. Um, we did have a question in from Sehi um, who has asked as an HR admin and often the first point of contact for staff for HR matters, um, how can I sort of address these issues to, to management and get that across? And um, also added, uh, to further add context, I'm in the nursery sector and due to COVID, I don't generally have access to the nurseries or communicate with the staff, so it's sort of in person. So I think there's a remote aspect there as well. But yeah, I think that's an interesting question about how does HR take this to, to upper management, I guess, and to kind of really put across the that's yeah, just just a thought I've got on that, Camille. You know, isn't this the problem in so many organisations that somehow HR seems to be it, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a huge amount of pressure to put on HR, particularly in the circumstances we've just heard. And this is why well-being has to be re the responsibility of all departments, of all leaders, and not just one department. You know, HR shouldn't have to go and sell this to the leadership. The leadership should be bought into it. Uh, already so um, I think there's a bigger issue at uh, stake here. I, no, no, so I'm ever so sorry I, I completely lost connection. No worries really glad you've been able to hop back in. <laughs> I just dropped off completely um, and just to say I think absolutely right Steve I've, I've had lots of conversations with organisations where there's a real sense of that that HR are the drivers, HR are the people who uh, are getting these conversations and information being fed to them. And it absolutely has to be about the leadership and it, and it is about everybody feeling that they're able to lean on each other as much as that they can lean on their, their managers and, and their leadership team too. Awesome. We've had a really really good question just coming from Alta, um, which I think uh, on a similar kind of, of echo, but particularly on psychological safety. Um, from a HR perspective, how do we handle C-suite micromanagers who don't encourage psychological safety? A changed job. Sorry, <laughs> no, that was a bit, uh, bit flippant. <laughs> Move to another company. <laughs> <laughs> it's like awareness though isn't it that's yeah. the challenge when you have and we've all been there haven't we we've all had colleagues or managers who talk a very good game about what they're what they're good at and you look around the room and their team are eyes down won't make, make eye contact and you know that they don't they, that what they're saying is not what they're doing and there's a lot of research around that health good healthy teams in terms of performance and well-being have a leader who walks the talk and so this is really important isn't this is not about do as I say not as I do so it's that creating that culture if you are a manager sending emails at 10 o'clock at night but then saying to people I really encourage work-life balance you are you are saying something you are doing something completely different to what you're saying and and workplace is often like parenting as children look at parents and follow what they see their parents do, it's exactly the same in organisations. So if you have individuals who are not walking the talk, either the mission, vision, values of the organisation or this micromanagement and not giving staff that space, then the next level up and the team around them have got to have that conversation with them and help with the self-awareness and help them to see that they need to... They need to it needs to match because people see straight through that yeah 
just checking that I'm still on. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think, Zoe, you know, I completely echo what, what Zoe says, you know, because psychological safety is, is very much about feeling that you can be yourself and that part of that also means being able to juggle the plates that you're spinning in the most effective way that allows you to be productive and continue to thrive because and I, and I know Zoe mentioned it earlier that about you know it's not just about doing well for people while they're at work it's about recognizing we have to support them to be well outside of work too because when you're thriving at home you don't leave your work life you don't leave your personal life at the door when you walk through into work you know many of us are operating in the environment at the moment and so taking that time and space and recognizing that you know, taking the time out to almost set those rules, those those boundaries that we're all going to have for ourselves. So as a team, you know, are we are certain people going to choose to log off at a certain time or do certain things? Because if somebody is choosing to send that email at 11 o'clock at night, for them, it might be because actually they've taken several hours off during the day. So not necessarily by having that communication, recognizing that this isn't something about I want you to echo this behavior it's about allowing people to step back and go actually this is what works best for me and I'm letting you know as a team this is what works best for me and I think that's the difference you, to, uh, just to add to that think about the tools that are available to you that will allow you to work in a way that works best for you that doesn't have a negative impact on other people. So if you want to work at 11 o'clock at night, can you schedule that email to go out at eight o'clock the next morning? Yes. So yeah. you work in, in a way that works best for you, but it still doesn't have, it. you're aware yeah. and understanding and respectful of the impact that that might have on somebody else. So if you can schedule those emails to go out at eight o'clock the next morning, it's a win-win situation. So it's about looking again, the individual, going right back to what we said at the beginning of understanding who wants what, who works best, who, how can you bring your team together to have that understanding and that awareness, work in a way that works best for you, but be, and it's that respect, consideration, understanding of who else is around you to be able to do that. And yeah, as Caroline has just put in the comments, it is about effective communication. Awesome, thank you. And I realise we're, we're coming up to the hour here and we, we do want to finish promptly. Um, so I think I'm going to have to wrap things up at this point. Um, thank you so much to our panel, Steve, Zoe and Asha. Thank you all for your brilliant insights and discussions. Um, I've just put up some information on our next webinar, uh, which is around disciplinary investigations with Sarah Edwards from Howard. Um, and I put a link in the chat there for anyone who wants to sign up for that. Um, but in the meantime, thank you. To all our attendees um, for your brilliant questions and comments and insights as well um, and um, I think we'll wrap things up now as we're coming up to 11 so thank you very much everyone